The views expressed on the Final Straw Radio do not necessarily reflect those of Asheville FM, Friends of Community Radio, or any of the affiliate radio stations airing the show. From the studios of WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is the Final Straw, and I'm Bruce Dickens. Ahem. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw, care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. The show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. We're speaking with Betsy Rosh Gilman, an anarchist of many years operating out of St. Paul, Minnesota, about the movement for a new society, about Quakerism, about anarchism in its various forms, her involvement in the Republican National Convention, counter-protests of 2008, and more. For a longer version of this interview, take a look at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org or subscribe to our podcast on many of the platforms that are out there. And now a few words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say, what you say, what you say, what? Everything I'm about to tell you is absolutely true, except for the parts I made up. According to the Associated Press, Lebanon, Ohio, the area surrounding this prison, is dealing with a serious monkey problem. Folks in the local area have taken pictures of monkeys that appear to be flourishing in the forests and wild spaces surrounding the town. Officials claim the monkeys were probably pets that were released. This monkey infestation in Lebanon, Ohio, made national news. Suggest to you, however, that officials have it wrong and that these monkeys are not merely released pets. These monkeys are really trained operatives in a groundbreaking, earth shattering, clandestine program to destroy civilization. Some context. Recall, in 2012, the federal bozos of intimidation and the Ohio Department of Retribution and Corruption identified me as monkey number four of the Army of the Twelve Monkeys. Along with three other prisoners, James Jalilia, Les Dillon, and Sean Marshall, I was tortured at Mansfield Correctional's Special Manglement Unit. Three of us, all but Marshall, were sent to Ohio's Super Duper Max. Marshall was sent to Lucasville. All of us have been labeled the leaders of the Army of the Twelve Monkeys. The Twelve Monkeys are still on the FBI's secret squirrel watch list. I've been under perpetual investigation for five years, and I suspect they might just be on the verge of discovering something. But it appears the fascist bozos of intimidation aren't very good at math. Four from twelve leaves eight. If it's the army of the twelve monkeys, and they only nabbed four of us... At any rate, I can now reveal to the world and to the 19 people listening to this claptrap what the other eight members of the twelve monkeys have been up to. They've been plotting to take down civilization. The Army of the Twelve Monkeys really is an army of monkeys. We have a training camp in an undisclosed location deep in the woods, where normally benign, poop-flinging, leg-humping little primates are transformed into miniature gorillas. Miniature gorillas. That means two things. We radicalized these monkeys by showing them the online footage over and over again of Cincinnati cops shooting and killing the lowland gorilla Harambe at the Cincinnati Zoo. You ought to see the rage build on their faces as they watch it. The monkeys are put through vigorous physical training, and by the time of their release, they are twice the strength of the average primate. They're trained in karate and jiu-jitsu, evasion techniques, and methods for resisting interrogation. So, even if they're captured and even tortured, these little maniacs will never squeal. They receive small arms training with pistols, but not rifles. At first, we attempted to train them with automatic rifles, but that didn't really work out well. Just imagine a couple dozen 30-pound monkeys losing control of AK-47s. It was pretty hectic. Monkey number seven still walks with a limp behind that fiasco. The written testing for the monkeys is pretty intensive, too. Strategy and tactics, explosives, reconnaissance. These monkeys can employ bolt cutters to cut fences, can pilot drones, and can drop fellow monkey rebels into enemy territory using those drones. I'm happy to announce that the first column of monkeys has now been released into the wild around Lebanon, Ohio, home to Lebanon Corruptional and Warren Corruptional. With any luck, this is the first of many columns of monkey rebels to be released into the woods in Ohio and beyond. They're likely dumpster diving, 
and scavenging food, and they've built themselves shelters. I have enough good information that on the weekends they break into a local store and get liquored up, spending the nights flinging <laughs> and humping each other. But during the week, these monkeys are all about business. Monkey business. And just in case you haven't already considered the implications of all of this, let me spell it out. When this first column of monkey gorillas proves to be a fantastic force for disruption and havoc to the slave system holding all of us hostage, radicals and rebels everywhere will jump into this barrel of monkeys, training their own monkey operatives in arson, bombings, bank robberies, and perhaps even political assassinations. If you see a squadron of drones dropping monkeys onto riot police, or under the roofs of courthouses or legislatures. Those aren't Trump voters coming to thank fellow Trump voters. Those monkeys are the vanguard for the next revolution. They're quick, agile, and hard to shoot. And they can bite your face off. I'm told that rebels aren't just training monkeys either. Monkey number three and monkey number eight of the Army of the Twelve Monkeys have made repeated trips to SeaWorld, giant coolers full of fish, in order to recruit dolphins and killer whales. They've successfully radicalized Shamu. Now they just need to find a way to get him into the Ohio River. It won't be long now before monkeys converge upon the central fixtures of the civilization program to both figuratively and literally poop on them. I bet they've got little transistor radios listening to me right now. The point is, it might take a thousand engineer geniuses to create and maintain a complex, sprawling social and economic system with millions of moving parts. But it only takes a monkey with a nice sized rock to f it up. Let's all aspire to be monkeys. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from War and Corruption in Lebanon, Ohio. If you're flinging, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at Sean Swain 243 205 Warren CI, P.O. Box 120. 5787 State Route 63, Lebanon, Ohio, 45036. Updates on his situation and more writings by Sean can be found at seanswain.org. We're speaking with Betsy Rosh Gilman, a longtime anarchist from St. Paul. Uh, we decided to chat about what being an anarchist during periods of, well, maybe that's not even fair to say, but it how I had worded it was um, periods of a low time in U.S. anarchism, and we'll cover a lot more, hopefully, during this conversation. But thank you very much for taking the time to chat, Betsy. Delighted. Delighted. Can you talk a bit about your upbringing? Were you a red or black diaper baby, and did you have any religious upbringing that might have influenced you? Yeah, I was actually a pink diaper, diaper baby. My mother was a socialist, or at least she identified as a socialist at that time, and she now identifies as a green, but I was brought up with the idea that socialism was a perfectly acceptable political philosophy. And so that, that was that was really kind of a foundational piece for me. And that was in a time when to be called a communist or a socialist was kind of like, it was a dirty word. It was a uh, derogatory label. So um, the fact that my mother was willing to say she was a socialist was pretty pretty important to me. As for religious uh, background, I was, my parents were Quakers and they had met at a, or they'd worked in a Quaker work camp before I was born, but they, there was no Quaker meeting in St. Paul, Minnesota when I grew up. So they sent me to the Unitarian church instead. And that the Unitarians did great by me, but as soon as I, there was a Quaker meeting available to go, I started going to Quaker meetings. And I have, I'm still a practicing Quaker. For a lot of listeners, they may not have familiarity with, with Quakers. Can you oh, talk about, sure. like, what the tradition is, a little bit about where it, about where it comes from, excuse me, and, and how it over Because it seems to really overlap with a lot, of, a lot of very conscious political activity. Not that there's a specific tendency to it, but that there's an engagement in this, in this world that's really important to it. Yeah, that's right. Quakerism, Quakers are Christians, liberal Protestant Christians. Quakers in, in do have a, a real orientation towards social justice and towards service, social service. It's a historic peace church, so it's a, Quakers are pacifists by and large. Now, the exception to these, all these rules I'm telling you are, was Richard Nixon. Um, I had no idea. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, he uh, comes from a branch of Quakerism that is uh, of the evangelical variety of Christianity. And so he, he, was, he was a Quaker, embarrassingly enough to the rest of us. And, but the Quakers are, they often, we often engage in issues of war and peace and in issues of racial justice and e- equality of women and equality of female bodied people to male bodied people. And justice issues just right across the board. We were in the cutting edge of Protestants who uh, would marry gay and lesbian couples before it was legal to do so. Do so. Quakers kind of pride themselves on this stuff. Eh, you know, um, it's practiced, the, the social engagement is varies from one location to another and one congregation. Well, we call, our, our, call it meetings, actually, not congregations. We, we use different language than most Christian churches do. But uh, it varies a lot from one location to another. But I, I happen to, I belong to the most progressive, uh, the most politically liberal branch of Quakers. We also, another little factoid about it is, is we worship in silence. So there's no spoken ministry. There's no prepared ministry. Um, and occasionally somebody will speak out of the silence when they feel like they have something that uh, is a, a, something to say that's of might be of interest and use to the rest of the group. But we, we don't have ministers and well, or rather we don't have paid ministry. So in my, in my denomination, my branch of the denomination. Others do diff- do it differently. So, so anyway, that's a little bit the thumbnail about Quakers. Thank you. Yeah. So you became involved in Movement for a New Society in the 1970s. I did indeed. What, yeah. What was this network, and what's it vis- its vision for revolutionary change? Well, Movement for a New Society was a net uh, was a network of individuals and groups that wanted to pick up from the end of the the Vietnam War protests, uh, as the Vietnam War was winding down, and as the, in the wake of the uh, actual government quashing of the civil rights movement, the repression of the civil rights movement, activists who wanted to continue the work on into the future, and also who were informed by the publication of a book which is not usually remembered now, but it was called Limits to Growth. And it was a study about the ecological damage that industrial society is doing to the planet. And basically put out that capitalism is limited by the amount of um, exploitation it can do of the, the planet. So there are limits to growth. And capitalism is really based upon economic growth and expansion. So those threads, the, the anti-war thread, the civil rights or social racial equality thread, the, the environmental thread, feminism was another big piece of movement for new society, got started in the very early 1970s and the feminist movement, the white, white feminist movement was very strong at that point. And m in, incorporated a lot of things from the feminist movement, also from the gay rights struggle, which was Stonewall was in 1968, so that the gay rights struggle was coming, it was very much in full swing when Movement for New Society began. So we, we incorporated a bunch of different strands. We incorporated anarchism. And in the uh, Movement for New Society was uh, both anarch- it was anti-capitalist, I think is what we really can say. Some of us were more anarchist in orientation, some of us were more socialist in orientation. But we were definitely anti-capitalist. So we saw these over, we called them, there were six overarching realities, which I'm not sure I can name anymore, but capitalism was one of them, patriarchy was another, um, racial po- uh, hatred was another. The things that we all together, we had to kind of address all of those issues at the same time in order to do what we wanted to do, which was to overthrow the United States government. And, and we wanted to do that through nonviolence. So it was a, a very ambitious uh, undertaking. I, in, my, in our own defense, I can say, I mean, you might listen to that and think, <laughs> were these people nuts or what? But I want to say that it, the times were very different in the early 1970s and really throughout the 70s. P- 
people talk, it's very common now to talk about the 60s as being a time of real um, turmoil, and, and it was. The 1970s, though, was a time of really exploding political growth and um, multiplying efforts to change the, the very fabric of U.S. society and the economy. Um, so the 1970s were a very, um, tur- uh, not so much turbulent, but a really productive time, and a time when ho- it was easy to be hopeful. I recently reread a, a book that was published in the mid '70s by Marge Piercy called uh, "Woman on the Edge of Time." Oh, it's so and good! Was, That's one yeah, of my favorite novels. Yeah, and I was really struck at re- re- rereading it. This is my third time reading it, but it, rereading it now, I thought, "Wow, it seemed very." It, she she seemed so hopeful about the possibilities that there could be this. That, that this this utopian society of the future could be pretty much on the verge of just mopping up the last bit of the resistance. And I can't, I can't remember the year she said it in, but it was like 2050 or something like that. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> that is a very optimistic view of the world and uh, not and one that I think I probably subscribe to at, at the same time that, that Piercy was writing. So that's, that's, it's really, it was interesting to look back and, on that and say, ha, huh, it looked, it looked easier then. So there's, there's that. So Movement for New Society, one of the things that I'm rather fond of saying is that we generally, as a whole, we mistook a clear vision for a short distance. And we were pretty clear about the kind of world we wanted to live in but we were way optimistic about how quickly that would happen. And as I say, it was a very ambitious program of um, completely overthrowing the United States government and, oh, by the way, patriarchy, and, oh, by the way, militarism, and, oh, by the way, <laughs> all and capitalism and all the rest of the things that uh, that were part of the, the, um, the, the form of the repressive nature of our society still today. So that was Movement for a New Society. We were small uh, groups of people scattered throughout the country, and re- really uh, we had connections with folks. Um, we had members in other parts of the world too, um, primarily Southeast Asia and Canada, um, But so we were somewhat international. Um, and we had much more influence because we had a very active program of training. So that people, uh, we, we, we worked up a program of training in social change skills. Um, so we would have weekend workshops that were kind of an introduction to Movement for New Society, primarily in Philadelphia, but then also uh, two-week training programs for people who wanted to learn the skills of social activism um, in a living way. People came to Philadelphia, mostly came to Philadelphia for those training programs. And there was a year-long training program as well uh, for people who would move to Philly, find jobs, move into a communal household in Philly, um, and just devote themselves to that project for a year. Uh, so we had a lot of influence, a much uh, kind of an outsized influence for the number of people we were, uh, which was really a fairly small group. I don't think we probably had more than 200, probably less than 200 members officially um, at any given time. That's that really is surprising, considering how how big of an impact the activities that you all engaged with were. Yeah, yeah. The other the other piece of it was that as we had a network that was around the uh, was had branches around the country that we spread issues through the issues that we worked on in one place, we would spread those issues to another place, and we had since we had those connections with one another, we were we kind of these spark plug people and all over the country were participating in the same movements and spreading the influence that way as well. So you had mentioned that a lot of elements within the MNS were anarchist and you've described yourself Uh as one. Yep. When did you start describing yourself as an anarchist and and who and and what influenced or inspired you to do that? I I was thinking about that recently. Um, 
during while I was in MS, one of the things I did early on was to participate in a study group, which was a self-run study group. We looked at different political philosophies. We, uh, a small group of us got together and each of us would read like a small chunk of a book or a chapter or something like that and bring it back. We read different things and we'd bring back a little description of what it was we'd read so that we could kind of cover more ground together than we could cover it alone. And the study group had uh, the philosophy of anarchism, socialism, feminism, and um, ecology. I think those were the four ones that we looked at. So uh, that's when I really began to understand what anarchism was. And the one of the books that we read, and I still have on my shelf, was called The Anarchist Collectives. And it was a, a compilation edited by Sam Dolgoff with an introduction by Murray Bookchin, who they, it was about the Spanish anarchist collectives of the Spanish Civil War. That was really foundational to my understanding of how we might organize our society in the future. And so I, I resonated to the anarchist vision. Um, I, I never felt like really and antagonistic towards the socialist vision, but boy, if I was going to put my effort into something, it would be the more anarchist combination of worker managed economy and neighborhood or geographically based neighborhood organizations that would run social life and, um, and relationships. So, um, and then we, then we later kind of put that together also with uh, a vision of, um, bio regions, um, ecological bioregions within the North American continent and the possibility of breaking down the, the structure of the United States into these bioregions so that the economy, uh, which is based in the, the ge geology and the biology of an area, would be, a, that we, we might wind up with seven or eight smaller social ecological groupings where these worker-run collectives and neighborhood-run collectives could work on a smaller scale so that we would not have the large nation states of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, but rather we would be looking, working and making decisions based on the bioregion that we happen to be in and what was good for the planet and what would, how we could sustain ourselves within that, that area, that physical area. So those were um, some of the, the pieces that formed my understanding of anarchism and where I got my introduction and where I got my start. Um, I should also say that as for Movement for New Society, um, I think we probably put more attention as a group, as a whole, into defining feminism and our relationship to feminism and how feminism informed all of what we did. It was, again, depends, you know, this is the context of the time that the feminist movement was very strong. Um, the anarchist and socialist movements were not as strong, um, partly because of the stigma that was attached to anything that was could be labeled socialist um, or, God forbid, communist. Um, there was a great, the left was very allergic <laughs> to the idea of any critique of capitalism. <laughs> And that applied a little bit to people within MNS too, that there's just a certain like, oh, I don't want to mess with that area. But feminism, that I can really relate to, that I can really understand. It's a very clear and a very important piece of our political development, our political program. We have a lot of unlearning to do in order to create the kind of society that we want to live in. And that feminism is a big piece of the remaking of our world. So I think in in practice for the, well, I think it was 18 years that Movement for New Society existed, we probably put more effort into defining and working with feminism than we did with either socialism or anarchism. Um, it seems like there are a lot of, I mean, it doesn't seem like, there are a lot of different approaches to feminism that people that people come, come with. Like yeah. you mentioned before, white feminism and... Yeah. Um, and you could counterpose that with like yeah. a black feminism or a POC feminism that specifically takes in like 
that takes in either specific people's experiences with the intersections, which intersectionality, I think, was a new thing at this time that was yeah. really being like introduced into activist lingo, but intersections of race and class and gender and region and all these things. Can you talk about maybe why why it seemed, even if you were mostly talking about feminism, what what seemed to sort of correlate between an anti-capitalist approach and a feminist approach? Um, uh, the, the exploitation of the planet was a big one, that the planet is treated kind of like a female body is treated, and that patriarchy violates on a regular basis female bodies and the planet. I think in... Yeah, that's that's the the first thing that comes to my mind. Uh, ask the question again. <laughs> Maybe there will be more if you ask the question again. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, those are those are like sensible correlations, like in terms of uh, women under patriarchy being treated in the same way that the planet ecologically is is treated under capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, it so it, mm -hmm. it makes sense that you would kind of like correlate or or yeah. make these kind of comparisons. Yeah. Um, did oh. Oh, yeah, go for it. I, I remember that the other thing I was going to mention when you asked that question, which was the different kinds of feminism. Um, uh, we, we, within m and we uh, grappled a lot with lesbian separatism. Movement for New Society was um, a all-gender welcome uh, organization. And we also recognized that the most creative, the most... Um, radical, the most visionary work came from lesbians. And so, uh, and many, many of the women who were involved in the movement for new society identified as lesbian um, and it received some critique and also some curiosity from the lesbian separatist wing of the, the, feminist movement at the time like you know why are you working in an organization with men but then on the other hand really there are men who will take feminism seriously are you i remember a specific example of that that uh, we had a group of lesbians who are organizing a, a march in the twin cities it was called the women against violence against women march in 1979 i think it was and uh, some of the women from MS and s were, um, were, they were talking about the possibility of men heckling the march. The march was planned for late at night um, through a district that had a lot of porn, porn movie theaters at that time and um, uh, bookstores that sold pornography. Um, so they, uh, the w uh, women in the planning group were saying, well, I mean, we're going to be harassed by these men. And so one of the MNS women said, well, I think I know some men who would act as marshals. And, um, uh, but I think actually they would probably, uh, they would talk to other men and they would keep men from disrupting our march either because they thought they would be supportive and they'd march in front of us and guard us. We don't want that. That's not the idea of the march. But we, ha I, we have some men who, I think I know some men who would be on our side and who would work with other men for, to make the march go smoothly and try to keep men in, kind of in check. And, so, and it was a kind of like, you do? You know some men like that? Are you kidding me? That was the, that was the reaction about from women who were not part of a movement for new society that they didn't really trust that there were men who took feminism seriously and who would pitch in to make a specifically feminist, woman-run, woman-centered march actually make it a success. So that was part of it, you know that was a part of it too is that the the possibility of a group working together across genders for the eradication of patriarchy was kind of inspirational too and kind of you know we got some grudging respect as well for the 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 way the the possibility of tackling that pro that problem so no, I've, yeah, I've gotten way off the, <laughs> the topic of anarchism, oh, but that was, that was a kind of a tension that we worked with within m and was the tension around separatism, lesbian separatism, and the critique of what we were doing from that, from that angle, but also the kind of like curiosity about it, too. 
just to go further away from the sort of <laughs> away from the <laughs> tendency, like a that that makes me think of um, how much influenced how much how much you were carrying influences over from the civil rights movement when you did have white people putting their bodies on the line in solidarity with black folks and people of color who who didn't get to choose to put their lives on the line to go vote yeah. or to go participate yeah. or to go like go to the store or you know use public transit or whatever yeah and i think that yeah. sort of thing like definitely builds well, the, like it, it shows you what a future can look like and that a future can look different yeah 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 well it's a, and this tension over on separatism was also a carryover from the civil rights movement because there was a um uh parts of the so the black struggle for liberation really didn't want white participation or lead and and certainly didn't want any white leadership and felt like uh you know if you if you white people get in here you're just going to screw everything up because you already do let us alone and so there was a, a very definite black separatist movement in the late 1970s and there was a definite lesbian separatist movement in the um early 1980s too so um Oh, I was going to say that like the the approach that that the movement for a new society was taking by identifying these specific elements within society that are problematic and the people or the things that are affected by those negative things and organizing against those uh -huh. by holding those things in tangent in tandem. It all, I think I've been using that phrase a lot in tandem, but holding those things together, it seems to me to sort of counterpose the approach of like the the Marxist or the Maoist approach, which is generally yeah. that there's there's a central um, revolutionary identity or central struggle that everything else has to be put to the wayside of the back burner for, whether it exactly. be the the gender issue of the lesbian separatists or the race issue of some of the black black liberation separatists or the Marxian workerist approach that only views the worker identity as the important and revolutionary position to take. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly, exactly. And we were very consciously countering that kind of one, you know, trying to, that, that, that reductionist approach. We were definitely, we were consciously reduct, not go, going there. I think when we talked about our six overarching realities, we said, you know, these are all true and we need to address them all. And we're not going to say one is primary and the others are secondary. Yeah, that's fascinating. That must have been very very much a, a point of contention in the political world at that time. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Marxists didn't like that very much. <laughs> but it still is, too. I mean, yeah. people people get their blinders on, and, and it's it's also hard when when you look through history and you hear about struggles for change or revolutionary struggles, you know, being co-opted by other sides as opposed to people coming together necessarily and finding a balance where you can hold all of these things at the same time and agree that they're all wrong. It doesn't have to be some sort of hierarchy of, of who is missing out the most based on the terribleness of our society. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, I still believe that that's kind of a non-starter. It's one, a way that we keep ourselves being less powerful than we could be. So, yeah. yeah. In this period, as the Cold War burned, the largest anti-capitalist tendencies were the statists, uh, yep. with, I imagine, people looking to the Warsaw Pact Nation or other state capitalist ventures calling themselves communist as the natural alternatives to the imperialism at home and abroad in the USA, with nuclear war looming very, very closely overhead. Huh. wonder what that reminds me of. Can you, yeah. <laughs> can you talk yes. about what organizing during this period as an anarchist was like? Yeah. And again, I want to say that the broader left, well, okay, so you mentioned nuclear war. Um, one of the places where Movement for New Society put a lot of energy was into the peace movement that bloomed under Reagan. President Reagan came into office in 1981 he, and immediately started a really dangerous program of saber-rattling saber with the Soviet Union, which existed at that time. And so it scared a lot of us. <laughs> it scared us a lot. And there was a the peace mo There was a, a large peace movement as a reaction to this. Um, partly, and and, and uh, it was also it was international. Um, the people in Germany and in um, Great Britain and in Italy 
also reacted because actually the, the nukes were stationed on their soil, not on, you know, the U S had some, but the U S was putting its nukes over in Germany and over in France and in Italy. And they didn't like that idea very much. They were going to be first, first out if there was a nuclear exchange. So there was an international peace movement at that time. And I remember that with a movement for new society, um, we, we tried to influence that peace movement in the direction of um, a critique of capitalism. But in, w there was very, there were, if you began to talk, if I began to talk about having a critique of capitalism as being a piece of the, the militaristic, jingoistic thing that was going on, people, uh, other peace-oriented people would say, oh, well, we, we can't talk about that. We can't really go there. That, that we, uh, we're not communists, you know. And it was easy to, easier to make a connection with the abuse of the environment by the military. It was easier to make it, certainly easier to make connections about the military's patriarchal foundations. It was harder to make the connections between the military's effect upon our economy and the fact that we really, the whole economy of the United States is still structured on the military. It's, it's, a, it's a very large chunk of our economy, um, was then and it still is, and Reagan was making it, bu busy making it a bigger and bigger piece of the economy. It was, it was hard to, to bring those things up and to say, look, we, we could structure, capitalism is a problem. It's a part of the problem. And it, generally speaking, we got, when I brought that, those, that critique up, I got shut down um, because people were still, were so nervous about being labeled communist. Well, you know, the Soviet Union existed and it was, it was, that was the big enemy. And other Statist based, you know, the Marxist fringe, well, I shouldn't say fringe, the Marxist brothers and sisters um, <laughs> had the same difficulty, even worse than mine. Like, there was a group called the American Soviet, Fr Soviet Friendship Committee that I worked with in the anti nuclear movement or nuclear weapons movement. They were pretty much all old communists, but they couldn't say that they were communists. They said they were the American Soviet Friendship Committee. And, but basically they were all old communists. And so there was a lot of that sort of disguising an anti-capitalist critique in order to have some sway in the larger left, liberal leftist movement. And I, I just should flag here that I'm really talking about a very white context here, that the, the peace movement was very, the, the, at least the part of it that I participated in was really White, and so there was. It, it might have been different if it had been a more diverse, racially, ethnically diverse movement, but it was not. And to organize from an anarchist point of view was was tough because of this real allergy to to anything that critiqued capitalism. Now, when this uh, jumping ahead a bit, when the Soviet Union collapsed in uh, 1989. I didn't see the the ripple effect immediately, but within the next five years, it was much more possible to say, look, I think capitalism is really a problem and not get shut down by, by other leftists that I was trying to work with. E easier to say, you know what, the problem is there, it's right there, it's capitalism. And, and people were be becoming much more receptive to that by certainly by by the time that the u.s invaded iraq desert storm specifically i remember in the organizing against that invasion definitely hearing people were definitely willing to entertain that capitalism was a problem but that was also the beginning of the globalization push for globalization corporate globalization and there was a guy named h ross perot who ran for president in 1992 mm -hmm. with a well a critique of globalization and so after Perot had had begun to raise questions about what global uh, what corporate globalization would do to us, it became much more possible to talk about the the impacts of uh, corporate capitalism and um, to develop a crit critique of that and have people um, 
say, yeah, you know, you're right, of course. And uh, certainly it's not doing the planet any favors either. I would say that it, during the whole period of the 1980s into the early 1990s, it was awfully hard to come out and say, okay, let's let's organize for an anarchist future. It, it, it really couldn't be done. <laughs> and so I personally, as a, a, an activist, and I think the Movement for New Society uh, laid itself down in 1988, so we didn't survive the 80s. Um, but I think that others within m and had the same basic approach that we we would organize with what was available. And so that was often the peace movement, the, the anti-war movement, social justice movements, increasing movements then throughout the 80s for racial equality and uh, feminism. And movement, the, the women's movement really lasted right into the mid-late 80s as a movement. So we kind of went with what we could, where we could actually make some headway or some progress. I never forgot that I was working towards a, a future that would be basically an anarchist collectivist future. And that, so I never forgot that. And I kept, kept bringing it up when it was possible to do and sometimes kind of surprise people by saying, well, this is the kind of future I want to live in. I want to see the United States, you know, smaller land, not not have the United States as a, an entity even exist any longer and kind of lay out my, my future. I remember somebody saying, oh, you've really thought about this. I thought, yeah, I have thought about <laughs> this quite a bit, actually. <laughs> so um, it, the, the anarchist ideals really informed it were in the background of everything I was trying to do, but to organize around anarchism was tough until the Soviet Union fell apart. And even through the 19, you know, it, it got more possible through the 1990s. Hey, this is Bursa Goodness here. This is our conversation with Betsy Rosh Gilman, longtime anarchist agitator from St. Paul, Minnesota, as we talk about movement for new society, her experiences of anarchism in the 70s and 80s, and other topics. You can find out more about her current work at trainingforchange.org. I just wanted to take an opportunity to remind folks that we are taking submissions for merch art at the final straw. We'd love to get your design ideas for stickers, t-shirts, hoodies, hats, cozies, whatever, you know, swag. Uh, heartfelt submissions will receive a mixtape from the show's producers, Burst and William. And we don't have really any end date, but just remember something that we're looking for something that uh, relates to the show that relates to anarchism or audio production or spreading the fire of anti civ rage or, uh, you know, I don't know. Thanks to the folks that have already sent us images. They're pretty dope. You can mail us physical images at the final straw, care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. Please don't include any white powder. Or you can email us at the final straw radio at riseup.net. Please, if it's a big file, consider posting it to share.riseup.net and sending us a link. Thanks a lot. Some of the ideas and actions that the Movement for New Society is remembered for include its application of nonviolent direct action and spokes council models in the forming yep. and actions related to the resistance against the Nixon administration's project of proliferating nuclear power plants like little bunnies around the country. Yeah. Like little explosive bunnies. Can you talk about the role of Movement for a New Society that it played in this period and, and the role of resisting nuclear power plants alongside of resisting the nuclear weapons and war that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, that I think in many ways the um, anti-nuclear movement, beginning with the occupation of power plant that was under construction in Seabr Seabrook, New Hampshire, that really, that was a, a kind of a trigger point for the anti-nuclear movement generally. And part of why it did explode na nationwide after Seabrook was because of Movement for New Society. The, the authorities at Seabrook did a very stupid thing. 
they arrested 1,400 people who were occupying this. Uh, oh my gosh! No, yeah, it was a large, a large occupation of this this site that where the power plant was supposed to be built, and they arrested 1,400 people and locked them up in seven National Guard armories for two weeks while they tried to process all these these arrestees. Well, for two weeks, the they they had a little mini training camp inside each of these armories. Mm-hmm. Siberia. And, this is where the czar went wrong, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And Movement for New Society activists were in probably most of those armories organizing workshops, facilitating spokes council meetings, uh, working to resolve. It was, it was, you know, it wasn't pleasant being locked up in those armories and they, people got into each other's faces. And so, but m s folks, we tried to be sort of like people who could handle conflict in a creative fashion rather than just trying to shut it down or tell tell people just don't don't talk to each other or things like that, but try to actually address what could we learn from the conflicts that we're having. So that was you know just as nice a little training camp that they the the uh, the authorities provided. And when people were released from those armories, they, went back home to wherever they'd come from and they started their own anti-nuclear um, power movements. And so all that, it was a clamshell alliance that occupied the Seabrook plant, but all these little alliances started springing up all over the country. In my area, there was the Northern Thunder Alliance and there was the Northern Sun Alliance. And around Chicago, there was, I, there was a and one around Chicago that I'm blanking on right now. But there was a bunch of these these anti-nuclear alliances got started all with the same basic spokes council structure, the same basic grassroots up, non-hierarchical structure of how to organize organize a movement. And all these little alliances staying in touch with what each other was doing and from time to time helping out of like Diablo Canyon was another big issue and nuclear power plant built out on earthquake fault, if you can believe that. Yeah, really good idea. Yeah, real good, great idea. And so when Diablo Canyon needed bodies, they could call on the alliances uh, uh, in other parts of the country to come and and help to conduct their, their actions. And Movement for New Society was, as I say, never very large in, in numbers, but because of this training aspect of what we did, we had a big impact, especially on the anti-nuclear movement. Same thing was true then for the nuclear freeze movement that took place, uh, uh, built in during the 1980s. Also, the Pledge of Resistance to U.S. Invasion of Nicaragua was another place where Movement for New Society participated in this way of trying to uh, network together things that were happening all over the place and also provide a training to people who are coming into activism for the first time or new new to activism. And much of, sometimes we, we joke that process was our most important product because a lot of it had to do with just how we, how do we work together? How do we treat each other? How do we make decisions together? How do we be democratic, radically democratic? And a lot of that was informed by anarchism. The idea that we, we don't want a central committee making the decisions for us. We want to make the decisions ourselves. And in order to do that, we have to have processes that will allow as many voices to be heard as we can and to and yet to be able to make clear decisions and be able to move forward, not get ourselves bogged down and just kind of rehearsing the same stuff over and over again. So that was the process piece that MNS tried to offer to all the movements that we were involved with. And as I say, it was much of it was, it's really quite fundamentally anarchist in its approach. So y'all are to blame for all the really long consensus meetings that I have to sit through? Alas. Yes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> We tried to do better than that. But like, you should have seen our own gatherings. Oh, Ooh. man. <laughs> <It was so. laughs> no, that's interesting. Like, it, like since I, I came up in the anti or alter globalization movement, that's when I came into anarchist politics. And the people in Northern California who were teaching 
who are teaching about nonviolent direct action, doing trainings, who are talking about consensus, who are talking about the spokes council model, which that isn't something I had seen put in place until the anti-war protests in 2003 in San Francisco. It's it's interesting to pinpoint how these processes got tied in with with not just like um, protest politics, but where <clears throat> the radical influences that were in in like integrated with it yeah. came in. So another aspect of the work that the Movement for a New Society participated in was alternative economic models within capitalism. The idea of building an alternative inside of capitalism and using that as a base of struggle is an idea that has replanted itself, its its own roots, in the last 10 years in the U.S. with conversations about infrastructure and autonomy. I mean, it goes farther back, obviously. You can point to the Zapatistas are a clear example of the same thing, which for my generation was a huge influence in, in how we tried to do politics. Can you talk about what was the model, the role, and the application that you were aware of in pushes for cooperative business models, collective projects, and land trusts? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is another place that um, Movement for a New Society did a, uh, made a big, big dent because the co- cooperative movement and based in a critique of capitalism was pretty strong in the 1970s. And in... I wish it were this, that strong now. I personally, what, the way I made my living was working for about 11, 11 years altogether. I worked in a food co-op, and I was part of the, the collective management of a food co-op in, in Minneapolis. And so I know a lot about the alternative economic institutions. Like we could talk for an hour on that alone. And I think the impetus of, well, and again, I'm, talking from the Midwest, I'm talking from Minnesota, where there was a long tradition, actually, going back to the 1920s, of economic cooperation came with the fin- Finnish immigrants to Michigan and, and Minnesota and Wisconsin, also the Swedes, who also brought a, a model of economic cooperation. So there had been quite a bit of, uh, there were already were co-ops. We called it the third wave of food co-ops in the 1970s that came out of kind of a cult- broadly countercultural youth movement, quite, again, primarily. And I, I think my short answer is that the cooperative movement I was a part of was good for kind of practicing and developing ideas. It, it made me feel quite skeptical about the possibility of really reforming capitalism that way. We existed as a food co-op. I should say that, I mean, there was there was a very great network of food co-ops at that point and a network of other kinds of co-ops, housing cooperatives, um, uh, uh, the land trusts, as you mentioned, the, uh, a bunch of ap- experiments with how to use cooperation as an economic a basis for an economic life rather than competition. But we existed within the structure of capitalism and we unfortunately succumbed to the structure of capitalism. The The problem is that word capital. <laughs> In order to do much of anything, we needed capital. That's the whole basis of the structure, the, the capitalist system. So we got lucky in that we could start a bunch of uh, small businesses, low tech and low skilled. Running a food co-op does not require a whole lot of skill. A lot of people can put cans on shelves and can drag around boxes of produce and, and stuff like that. But so at low skilled, we came in on the end of the mom and pop grocery stores as supermarkets were actually developing and putting mom and pop grocery stores out of business we moved into the the actual literal buildings and the coolers and the equipment the cash registers left behind by these mom and pop operations that had to fold up shop couldn't compete with the the supermarkets and we filled a, a very specialized niche of natural foods which were very pretty much un very few people really cared about natural foods in the early 1970s. So we had a market niche of natural foods and we had the the infrastructure and it was a low skilled low, uh, operation so we could capitalize it with our labor, which is what we did. The co-op where I worked, a, a share of stock was $2. 
and you became a member and earned a discount by volunteering your time. Um, you got to vote in the running of the cooperative because you had that two dollars share of stock, but it, you also had to you had to put some time in too, a certain number of hours in order to be a voted member. And we it was not in the people were not really interested or thinking about the possibility of redistributing wealth through the cooperative structure I was. I've that's still why I even the co-ops have changed dramatically since that time and gotten very quite glitzy and upscale. I still chop at co-ops because it it basically tries to keep the wealth in as many hands as possible. It co-op the cooperative structure gives any profit back to the people who've invested in it and whether, who've created that work. Whether well, it be the worker owners or the uh, consumer cooperative, right? Yeah, right, right. We started out in my, my area of the country anyway, we started out with worker co-ops um, so that the, the, working, the working made your membership and made your profit. You, 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 you got rewarded for the number of hours you'd put in. Most co-ops... Um, in the late 1970s, early 19, well, mid, throughout the mid 1980s, converted to the consumer co-op model because of the capital problem, that they needed more capital and they needed to raise actual money, not just labor, but money, to buy new coolers, to expand the stores, to remake the stores. As I said at the beginning, that capitalism is premised on the growth. The, the ability to grow, and that affected us as co-ops as well, that we wanted to sell more stuff, there was more food available that we could sell, the organic movement really took off, or organic farming really took off in a big way, and we could sell more stuff, people demanded more stuff, people's expectations of what a co-op or a grocery store would look like, everything around us was being more bourgeois and uh, more upscale and the pressure was on the co-ops to do the same thing. I can talk about this because my co-op that I worked at was one of the last holdouts of a worker-owned co-op in the Twin Cities. And it, it we consciously, we talked about how do we not grow? How do we be successful without growing? And we never came up with that an answer to that. There was We had to say the pressure in a capitalist society means that we really can't do what we would like to do. And we we are going to have to grow. We are going to have to have a bit new building. We're going to have to move to a, a place where we have more room. Uh, we can carry more stuff. We can have where the, the coolers are not breaking down all the time. We have to buy more stuff. And all of that requires more capital. We managed to get away because we've been successful early on. We, man we had some reserves. So we managed to get away without turning into a consumer co-op, but we also folded. <laughs> but it was a good 30-year run. I mean, we, it was 30 years by the time that co-op folded, and I wasn't involved to the, till the bitter end. But to me, it really pointed out the difficulty with trying to form an alternative economic system from within the shell of the old one. Capitalism is so difficult to... It, 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 we. It just, it, it doesn't give us a lot of room to do something different. So I, do, I hate to be discouraging in saying this, but I think it's, it's really important to go into this with eyes open. Otherwise, we spend a, a, a fair amount of time pursuing a, essentially a utopian strategy that we can somehow create our own little island over here that is separate from the capitalist system. And I have a great big critique of utopianism. And to the extent that an alternative economic system participates in a utopian idea that just by doing the right thing over here, we'll just get bigger and bigger. Our little co-op movement will get bigger and bigger and bigger and we'll just take over the capitalist system. Everybody will see the logic of cooperation rather than competition. They'll enjoy cooperation more than competition. It'll be a more satisfying way of life. I mean, I still believe all that's true, but it didn't work. And the capitalist system is far more insidious and far more difficult than I wish it were. And the utopian way of going about social changes, I, I, I believe, really kind of, um, it's just not very realistic. A bit naive, um, maybe. Yeah, just not very realistic. 
So that said, I also want to say that in, within, your, within anarchism, of course, there's always been and there remains a real wish to create the new society that, we're, that we want to live in right, right here, right now. And I must admit that as a, an activist of, you know, maybe 45 years worth of activism has been sustained a lot by little groups of people, like-minded people who, you know, I can take my problems to and they all understand the kinds of issues that I'm trying to deal with and give me pats on the back when I need them. And that little huddling thing also is very, very sustaining. But I think we're, we mistake, we're making a mistake if we think that by doing a, an ideal little society, a little ideal community, anarchist or otherwise, that that is going to somehow, that's going to make the revolution happen. It can, it does, it really does help and sustain us in trying to make the revolution happen, but it's not the same thing as, that's not the strategy, that's not the strategy that's going to work. It is really helpful and sustaining for basically organizing. But so flash forward a bit, it was the Republican National Convention. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You said, you said that the um, Movement for a New Society was laid down, in, which is a very peaceful way of, of saying it, in 1988, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Were there, well, in the meantime, before we get to the, the RNC, were there other activities that you were engaged with that you wanted to talk about in between there and and 2008? One of the things that uh, is true for me as an activist is that I've never quit. Um, and so I, I did sustain my own activism. Uh, uh, I, it was very, it was a big disappointment to me when Movement for, for New Society um, folded up. Uh, and it was a really, um, a very peaceful ending it was um uh we we love each other still um we i'm still in touch with people that i was friends with in movement for new society i'm still still friends with them and in we had a series of reunions so it wasn't a bitter a bitter end at all but we recognized that a revolution of the sort that we were talking about really had to be we could not be carried out only by white people and that we were pretty much all white people, and that we really weren't able to get beyond our our own cultural boundaries in order to become a more diverse organization. So we decided, no, we're going to end it rather than peter out in a really, you know, kind of a sad way. We're just going to end it, and we'll see what comes next. So that was that was why and why we laid it down in 1988 with a real you know, intentional process. And I continued to be involved uh, in peace work. I founded and was part of a training collective, came out of doing the same kind of training for social change, in social change skills, did that throughout the 1990s. Another organization that came out of Movement for New Society in some ways. It's called Training for Change, and I'm still involved in Training for Change. It's it's really expanded far beyond anything MNS did, and much better <laughs> in the training. In training, we're much, much better now than we were. So training became a piece of what I continued to do. And then in the late 19, uh, in 1999, I got a message from another old MS person who lived in Seattle saying, you know what, there's this great big thing that's going to be happening out here called the WTO. Anybody heard of this thing? And we're, this protest is going to be a lot bigger than we're going to be able to do the training for. Could y'all come? And so I said, sure, I'll come. So without having really any idea what I was walking into, I walked into the WTO protest in 1999. So I, uh, from that time until 2007, I was quite involved in the globalization, the resistance to globalization. And I did a lot of nonviolence training uh, uh, around the country. And then I even got to Germany to, to do some work with uh, the groups that were opposing the, the G8 meeting in, in 2007. So the globalization movement was a big part, uh, or the 
opposition, global justice movement was a big part of what I did in the early 2000s. It, you know, then I, th- I found anarchists all of a sudden. My gosh, there's lots and lots of anarchists. This is great. So um, I, it was it was a, a real, God, it was great. I thought, oh, my God, here, here they are. Here we are. This is terrific. <laughs> so so that was um, that was a real excitement in getting involved in the, the global justice movement. And then, oh, look at look what's coming to our, my town, <laughs> the Republican National Convention. Oh, sweet hallelujah. <laughs> uh, so I became involved in the um, RNC Welcoming Committee. Um, I participated in the Welcoming Committee pretty much throughout from when it was founded all the way through to the the convention, and then I participated in the committee to defend the RNC-8. I narrowly avoided being charged myself. I think, in large part, they didn't want they didn't want me in the case because it would have made it harder to make a case against the RNC-8. If it had been the RNC-9 and I was the ninth, it would have been harder to make the case against us. So they left me out, and I. But I was planning on. I would have been major witness for for the RNC-8 had it, had it gone to trial. But I then put in two and a half years in the defense work too afterwards. So altogether, that was like about four years of very intense work, um, planning for the, dem- the the convention and then, then mopping up afterwards. Yeah, so that, that was my, that's my story about the RNC-8, or you, you could ask more about that too. Well, yeah, so you've, you mentioned, so the, the, the point of the welcoming committee was to help to sustain a protest against the Republican Party and and the potential election and and protest against the 2008 elections, basically, but in particular against, yeah. Um, So the RNC-8 was a conspiracy trial that the state created against some of the people that were involved in the welcoming committee and in coordinating groups to to do protests during the Mm -hmm. convention. And that, it seems like that, a a product of surviving that (laughs) was was also learning a bunch of skills towards resisting state efforts at repression. Um, And I, I know that like having been around anarchist black cross groups and counter repression groups and having friends that have either been like on conspiracy trial or doing support work. It seems like this is a pretty like fundamental learning point for, for movement. Basically that repression is going to come when you try to resist. Can you talk Mm -hmm. about like a few lessons that you can take away from, from doing support for the RNC eight? Yeah. I can't say that I was super surprised that we experienced the repression that we did. I, I wish I had been more alert about exactly who the informants in our group were. I was not. And in, I think some of, the, some of the things that I learned were, I'm, I'm using that now still, ways to identify where we might be infiltrated, what I learned about how to identify infiltration. Um, Partly it was a real lack of clarity about politics. Now, I mean, truth to tell, there was a lot of lack of clarity about politics in the welcoming committee. Um, But there were the three people who turned out to be informants, four actually, never were, were, it was always a little puzzling. Why were they, why did they keep coming to our meetings? And that, that is something that I will carry away as a, um, an indicator of, like, uh, if I'm puzzled about what is, what's the motivation of this person for being here, well, the motivation might be that they're paid to be here. Mm-hmm. Ah, mm-hmm. now this begins the pieces call, fall into place. Um, so that was, that was uh, a real good lesson. And I think also I was... Well, I'll I'll say it, even though it, it's a little bit controversial. Um, I was troubled with the security culture uh, of the welcoming committee. I not that it wasn't good enough, but it that it seemed to be kind of uh, let it lent itself to real suspiciousness and and a, a certain self 
in deception about how that one could keep oneself entirely safe. Now, I say that even though some of the people did excellent jobs at keeping themselves out of trouble. So I, I guess I'm still puzzling over that. I'm still asking myself, I mean, on the one hand, I was feeling a little bit like, oh, the security culture, the way that we're approaching it, it seems to me not very realistic uh, and maybe a little self-delusional, but then it turns out we were in, in, we were infiltrated. So was it really all that self-delusional? Well, no, I guess not, but it surely didn't keep us safe either. I mean, security culture might have made it a little more tough for law enforcement, but they managed quite nicely to completely infiltrate us. So I, I don't know. I'm still kind of mulling over the, the lessons there. And of course, those were lessons that the Occupy movement had to deal with also, uh, just in a few, few years later, that uh, they were also quite thoroughly in, infiltrated. And that was a lot less conscious of, well, the Occupy movement was far more porous. There were there was so much coming and going. It wasn't a, an intentional small group of people working on a particular project like the Welcoming Committee was. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still kind of chewing on those lessons. I think uh, security culture, it's really necessary and also it, it, can, it can be detrimental, outright detrimental to organizing if, uh, like if you're changing the location of your meeting because you're afraid that somebody is going to infiltrate it, well, then the people that you want to come might not even know where to go. You know, there's, there's, there's some self-defeating stuff about security culture. And there's also, and yet it, it obviously, there's, it's so necessary, too. I, I'm still, I'm mulling this one. And I don't have a conclusion. Oh, yeah. That's and that's okay. I think that some of the more interesting approaches or the more applicable approaches towards security culture that that I've heard have been akin to what you mentioned about like if I can't figure out your motivation, maybe there's something outside of the realm of possibilities that I'm thinking of what might be motivating you to do that. I think likewise there are certain social patterns that people engage with sometimes when they're operating poorly with security with, with poor security culture yeah. that may be conscious or, or unconscious that relate to bragging about things, talking about things that aren't their business to talk about, other people's experiences mm-hmm. or histories, uh, att- attempting to pressure people into things or create divisions or splits as opposed to addressing things like if they have an issue, addressing that clearly between people and attempting yeah. to de-escalate or find a solution to a problem. Yep. Like, yep. But, but then there's the, yeah, we need to like shift around. We need to change names every meeting. We need to like, at a certain point, it does become self-defeating and, and Kafka-esque. One of the other really important things um, that I can think of that came out of the resistance to the Republican National Convention in 2008 was the Minneapolis principle. No, I'm just kidding. The St. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah. The St. Paul principles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that and kind of what, what led, what conversation led to that being adopted and, and what you think the implications of that are? Yeah. Yeah. The organizing to, to oppose the RNC, it was not just the welcoming committee. There was also a, a, a large march announced almost as soon as the RNC was announced. Um, the peace movement um, announced a, a large a large march to, to be during the, the RNC. Um, now, I should say that the peace, when I said the peace movement, we have in the Twin Cities, we have a very active chapter of um, the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. And so they, that was really the, the group that was working to do a, a large mobilization. Um, they were hoping to get, you know, several, many thousands of people to the, come to the Twin Cities and protest. And they wanted, they were planning on a, a, a permitted legal march. And there was a great deal of concern and discussion between them and between and the welcoming committee about how an anarchist non-hierarchical spontaneous space could be created where people could kind of do their thing and um, not be marshaled into a certain way uh, into a, a kind of a prescribed behavior 
and also have this big march that grandparents and grandchildren and strollers and people in wheelchairs could also participate in. So that was the origin of the St. Paul Principles. Now, we had the luxury there of 18 months in which to organize. So, and it, the relations between the anti-authoritarian, anarchist welcoming committee and the um, socialist informed peace march, the relations were not really easy during the whole of this 18 months period of organizing. As we grew closer, we started to say, okay, well, so we've got to figure this out. There were four days of the convention, to, and the welcoming committee had really aimed at the first day of the convention that we wanted to do our actions on the first day. Well, of course, the Peace March wanted to be on the first day, too. And then there were some other groups that were, and some other actions that were um, hoping to get scheduled during the, get their time during the four days of the convention, one of them being the... Um, Oh, welfare rights organization uh, that was going to be doing a march on the second day, which didn't have a, a, a real organizing presence locally until the fairly clo close to the convention. So the, the Freedom Road Socialist Peace Movement and the anti-authoritarian anarchist movement, we came together and over a series of about a period, about a month, we worked out the principles. I remember I wrote an early draft, which was way wordy. And there were other people who wrote big wordy drafts too. And, uh, and then we had just some sit down and talk it out meetings um, to come up with a very streamlined uh, four principles. And two of those came from Basically, two of those came from the welcoming committee and two of those came from the peace movement. And so that the principle of not criticizing each other in public, that was one of the things that we felt very strongly about, uh, that to divide the protesters into good protesters and bad protesters and have the peace movement critiquing the anarchists, that people felt very strongly that this was not acceptable. We really, really insisted on that. And the peace movement really insisted that we separate the actions in space or time. And we, we had to work out that conjunction, whether it was or or and. Um, that little conjunction took a lot of work. So we agreed that we could separate our actions in space or time. And then I am blanking on the other two because those were, they weren't as quite as difficult to get agreement on. I have seen the, the St. Paul Principles uh, as part of something recently where somebody just declared that we were going to use the St. Paul Principles, and I thought, no, wait a second, you can't just declare <laughs> that we're going to use the St. Paul Principles here. You have to get the agreement to use the St. Paul Principles here. That's why they worked, is because we had the luxury of uh, pre-planning and doing the hard discussion and building up some modicum of trust. It really was still not a very trusting relationship. Even after we got the principles down, we there was still a good deal of mutual distrust. Anarchists feeling like, don't you dare bring your marshals over and tell us that we, what to do. And we're not going to promise not to use the, the march as a launching point for a, an anarchist action or a more spontaneous action. We're not going to be policed that way. And the peace movement feeling like, don't you use us as protection. If you're going to do something that's going to bring the police down, don't come running to us. So there's a lot of, there was, it was tense, uh, really, and right, right through the action. In the event, of course, the police became the, the, the enemy of both of our groups. And, and As police, it should be. Yeah, and the policing really took center stage, where that, that really brought, we had a whole lot more solidarity afterwards because, of the way that the police came down on us. So the principals, I was really pleased to see the principals basically holding all through the follow-up actions too, because we had all these arrests and all these trials. We had, I think, 400 people arrested just in one day and they were charged largely with misdemeanors. We had 18 felonies, including, no, 18 felonies besides the RNC-8. 
and a whole bunch of misdemeanors. Um, most of the misdemeanors never went to trial. Some of the felonies did. And I don't think any of the felonies actually don't. You know, some of them did go through trial. Some of them did go through trial. So we had a whole a question of, of um, solidarity afterwards, as well as solidarity in the event. And the St. Paul principles held. There was not a lot of recrimination of, oh, if you only had saying in public that if if those nasty anarchists just hadn't done this, then the whole thing would have gone over off so much better. Or if those spineless peace people hadn't done that, we would have had a much stronger presence or a much stronger demonstration. There was not that public recrimination. And so it, I, I felt really, really happy with the, the process that resulted in the St. Paul principles and the, the, the way that they held up afterwards. I think that, um, but again, it's not something, they, they are a good basis for further action as long as there's a real discussion about what do you mean separated in space and time or space or time? What do you mean public criticism? Um, does that include Facebook? Does that include Twitter? Does that include you know, the, the, all kinds of ways that you really have to, you really have to know what you're agreeing to? So, anyway, that's I I, I feel like the the St. Paul principles they do strengthen our movement. Probably some of my MNS co- colleagues, if they heard me saying that, would be disagreeing with me. But I I think they do strengthen our movement, and it the the strength though lies in working out the details and what do they really mean and are we truly agreeing to these things yeah especially the the holding to the principles you can make you can make a you know any sort of statement but until all parties are on board with what it means and honestly engaging with them it's you know just a piece of paper or whatever it is yeah right right especially as the whole thing gets kind of changed and lost and and you know, nobody as people lose the memory of how what they really meant and what why they worked. Um, mm-hmm. But so, yeah. So, are there any projects that you're excited to see blossoming in your scene? How have you how have you seen St. Paul change uh, over the years while you've been organizing and agitated there, agitating there, agitated? Mm-hmm. You may have been agitated also, but uh, me agitated. too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I have been agitated. Yeah, I th- I think that um, some of the things that I feel most hopeful about, there is a real willingness to engage in public action that just wasn't there in, if I go back to the 1980s, even the 1990s, there just really was a, uh, I would, I would tend to see the same faces at every single demonstration I went to. And I kind of got used to thinking, well, for instance, you know, when the United States, um, we bombed uh, under Clinton, President Clinton, we bombed a, a pharmaceutical factory in Sudan and a training camp in Afghanistan. These, the, this incident has kind of been all glossed over in the following, you know, all the bombings we've done since. But I remember that the same group of people, a group of people organized with Afghani Americans in the Twin Cities, and we did protests and demonstrations around the bombing in Afghanistan in the mid uh, mid 1990s. And then there was also um, Sarajevo and the bombings in um, the U.S. involvement and uh, in the war in in um, Bosnia. And there was so we there's actually a fairly large Serb, Serbian population in the Twin Cities. And so we are, the Serbian Americans came out against that bombing, those bombing actions. And then there was the bombings in Vieques and the U.S., the naval uh, practice, there was a uh, target practice carried out in Vieques. So Puerto Ricans came out and in opposition to that. And yet there was a strain of people like myself and some some of my other friends who came out to all of them. And I began to think, you know, actually it's not bad that there are a certain core of us who care about bombs, whether they're in Afghanistan or the Sudan or in 
Serbia or in Albania or in Vieques, we care about bombs and that it's not entirely rooted in our self-interest. And so I, I came to kind of like honor the fact that there are some people who just will simply care about these issues regardless of where they happen or to whom they happen. At the same time, it, you get kind of tired of seeing the same old people at every single one of these demonstrations. And that I'm, that's not been my experience since I would say probably about, well, Occupy was the first time I noticed that I thought, hey, these are brand new faces. I haven't seen these people before. And that since that time, I have seen more and more brand new faces, more and more people I haven't ever seen before. And I really love that. I love that there is a, an increasing sense of, I can't just sit on the sidelines anymore. I have to do something. Because again, I feel like that's um, a piece of anarchism. If we're going to see an anarchist future, it really requ it requires people to not sit on the sidelines. It requires a, a willingness to participate in public life. And I, I, sometimes I think that's a, that anarchism really demands a lot of that and maybe a little unrealistic in some ways about just how much participation in public life we can have. But nonetheless, I think that it's for where we are today or where we have come from, that it's it's really good to see so many people who are willing to say, I want to participate in the formation of this society. I want to have a say in what's going on. I want to try to think about how we can do things better. And I'm willing to put some elbow grease and some time and some foot power into it. So I I think it's it's promising for the future, for an anarchist future, that we have so many people who are feeling willing to to speak up and to take part. I think that's what an anarchist future is going to depend on. So that it, that's one of the things that I feel really excited about. Currently, my my project that I'm working with is showing up for racial justice. The organ it's a national organization, but we have a very active chapter here in the Twin Cities. And I'm working particularly on the police, on policing and on the possibility of spreading, spreading the ideas of abolition of the police department, not just the prison system, but the police department itself, to particularly to people of European descent who have, have may not have even considered the idea before. And saying, well, you know, maybe it's time for us to think about that. Maybe it's time to think about ab abolishing it completely abolishing the police department and then having the conversations about like, well, so what, then what? And being willing to, to throw the ideas around and, and um, get more, because we have to start someplace. And certainly if, and I've heard many, I've heard a lot of people of color saying we have to abolish the police department and they won't be able to do that if white people get in the way. So to try to at least to somewhat normalize the idea of abolishing the police um, among people of European descent who have, unfortunately, the white privilege that otherwise they if at least introduce the idea, develop hopefully some sympathy for the idea of the project of abolition, at least neutralize the opposition. Uh, yeah, neutralize it if possible. So that's been, that's the thing that I'm working on right now. And again, with the the background, the fundamental commitment to an anarchist future, informing my politics and my actions, finding ways to um, develop both the, the culture of taking self-responsibility, of self-management, of self-discipline, those kinds, the culture that will be necessary to create an anarchist future, and also the the politics of not relying on authority and not declaring ourselves free of the, the need for our military authority running our lives or statist authority running our lives. Um, I think this is this is what I can see to do at the moment. That's lovely. Thank you, Betsy, so much. This is excuse me, my throat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I've been going on. No, 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 no. You're saying 
Uh, if only you could see, like, if there was a video option on this side, I'm just, like, nodding my head and with the microphone being down saying, like, yes, yes, preach it. <laughs> no. Yeah, but thank you so much for having this conversation. And I'm happy to, in the show notes, link to your organization, trainingforchange.org, correct? Yep, yep, you got it. Cool. Yeah, thanks so much for, for sharing all this info and these experiences and hope to get to meet you sometime. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope so, too. I hope so, too. Yeah. And thanks for reaching out. And thanks for doing taking the time. <laughs>